Hello, uh, we're here with Hillary Madsen, who is running for King County Superior Court Judge. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yeah, thank you. My name is Hillary Madsen, and I'm running for King County Superior Court Judge. The reason that I'm running is because I think that our legal system works well for judges. I think it works well for attorneys, but I don't think it works as well for people who are poor, people who are marginalized, people of color. So one of the things that I think is really important that I bring to the bench is an experience in representing people who are not typically heard in our court system. So children and youth in foster care, people who are locked up in jails and prisons, and immigrants who are looking for a better life for their families. I actually started my law school journey. I went to the University of Washington and while I was there, I was a supervisor for a shelter for teenagers who were experiencing homelessness. And it was that experience and the work that I did work with the, um, with the teenagers in that shelter that really inspired me to go to law school because I saw firsthand how systems and institutions could work together to limit rather than expand opportunity. So I set my course for law school. I went to Seattle University. I graduated and I joined actually a corporate practice. So when I left law school, I actually worked as a civil litigator. So working in areas of business and contract disputes. And then I realized that's not why I went to law school and I really wanted to be an attorney for people who couldn't afford Legal so I took all of those lessons that I learned in a big downtown law firm and I took them actually down to Pioneer Square where I was able to be a civil legal aid attorney. And I've had such an incredible experience advocating for people and I believe that we need judges on the bench and to have those experiences. So I am appreciating tonight the opportunity to speak to all of you. Great. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move into the uh, four prepared questions and Mackenzie has qu uh, posted question one. The responses are two minutes apiece to these and um, we're going to go ahead and start with Hannah. Wait, 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 I'm going. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I have to do this on my phone. It's like a whole thing. So, okay. okay. Let me see. All right. Here we go. Okay. Washington State. It, nope, that's the old one, right? No, no, there we go. Yes. Uh, what are the pros and cons of going to the bench as compared to practicing law? So I think one of the challenges uh, with moving from a practice where you're in court and where you're advocating for a particular client to the bench is when you're a judge, you're not on anybody's side. And I think that that can be a really tricky, I think that can be a really challenging shift. I think sometimes that can be tricky because it no longer becomes your job to present evidence on a particular person for a particular person's case. It no longer is your job to try to understand the argument from one person's point of view, but you actually have to take a whole step back and see all the different mechanisms and try to keep an open mind so that you can hear all the different arguments that are being made. And I think that can be challenging. And I think that it can be particularly challenging when you go from a from a uh, from practicing law to the bench when you take into account one of the major pieces of work at the king county superior court is actually our family law work and a lot of people the majority of people actually who participate in our family law court as litigants are doing it pro se which means they don't have attorneys and so it becomes your job as a judge you can't advocate for anyone but you also have to try to from the bench help people to self-advocate, right? You have to be able to explain the rules so that people can participate. And I think that that's something else that can be really tricky for judges, particularly for judges who don't have any experience coming onto the bench of working with people um, who are from seconds. communities that can't afford attorneys. So I think in my mind, those are two of the, of the big challenges, the being able to remain objective and then being able to work with people who don't have attorneys. Okay, thank you. Um, question number two, Jason. Uh, yes, Hillary. Um, what have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency, and what other methods would you suggest? So I think in King County, one of the challenges 
uh, and I was actually just talking about it on the phone today with someone who called me who needed some legal advice, is that we have a county that's huge in size, right? When we think about the population, and we have 53 judges. And they have to hear every case that gets filed in King County. It's really not a very proportionate number. And so I think one of the big challenges uh, in terms of maximizing efficiency of courtroom is how do you move that volume of cases while you're still respecting and hearing the issues that are being brought by litigants. So one of the things that I actually think is rather effective is the King County Superior Court has adopted rules so that not every single motion that has to be heard has to be heard live in front of a judge. So for example, on the civil side, only certain types of motions will actually get hearing time with the judge. The rest of the time, the decisions can be made on paper. And I actually think that that's a, I think that's a win for efficiency. And one of the reasons I also think it's a win is because it reduces the amount of time and pressure on individual people to make that trip to the downtown courthouse or the courthouse in Kent. Because when every time a person has to make an appearance at a brick and mortar courthouse, we're talking about having to schedule childcare, having to take time off of work, having to make arrangements, right, for transportation. And so I think the more the, our courts can use technology to reduce seconds. the burden of personal, like of the personal appearance pressure on folks, the more accessible our court system will be. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number three, Clayton. Hi, um, Hillary. Um, as a judge, would you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? What, I should have said, would you consider? your greatest strengths and weaknesses? I think as a judge, when I think about what makes an effective judge, I think about empathy. And the reason I think about empathy more than anything else is because judges have to recognize the human trauma that's unfolding in front of them. And they have to be able to listen and to provide dignity and respect to the people that are appearing in front of them. Even if what's happened is wrong, even if there's not an opportunity to fix it through the law, somebody has an issue that really can't be resolved, people need to feel heard and they need to be feel seen. And that, there's research on this that shows that that's what makes an effective court system, right? That people feel heard and they feel seen. And so I think empathy is a really important part of making people feel heard and seen. And that's the, actually the attribute that I admire most in judges. And I think in terms of weaknesses, I think that one of the reasons that I want to be a judge is because I want to be an effective administrator of our legal system. And so I think I may have a tendency to take on too much too quickly. And so one of the things that I have to work on on the administrative side is taking a step back and watching with a little bit more patience as certain reforms unfold because the court system is a big system and it just can't flip on a dime. And that's something that I need a lot of practice in remembering. We all, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, question number four, Brittany. Can you describe your most difficult case? Why was it difficult and how did you handle it? I'm just taking a moment to think because I've had a lot of challenging cases and I think it's, and I've had a lot of challenging cases because I take, so I take a lot of clients who have a lot of trauma, right? Children and youth in foster care in particular. And there is nothing easy about a case involving a child in foster care because even when you succeed, in achieving something for that client, victory isn't, isn't that great. I mean, it's still a hollow victory because at the end of the day, it's still a child who's in foster care, right? So I'm trying to think of something um, perhaps more complicated. I think actually the struggle to get 
children and youth foster. So to get the struggle to get attorneys to children and youth in foster care is something that I worked on at Columbia Legal Services. And that was really challenging because I made the argument that children and youth have rights under the Constitution to due process. And as part of that right to due process, um, the right to have the, the right to have a court consider before it takes something away from you. That's what due process is in essence, right? So in order for a child to have due process rights, that meant that they needed a court to consider all of their arguments before they could take something away from them. And so my argument was that children have rights in the constitution, including these due process rights. And that was really challenging because the case law doesn't favor children and youth right? Children and youth in Washington, depending on what statute you're looking at or what case you're looking at, are still considered chattel. So I think that was a really complicated case for me to take, both personally and legally, um, because the arguments were very complicated and based in the Constitution. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move into uh, follow-up questions, and the responses for these are one minute apiece. Um, and folks, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand or um, put a message in the chat box. Jason? Uh, yes. Uh, when I was growing up, my mom had a daycare <laughs> of 14 kids and um, so she could uh, help her uh, developmental uh, disabled uh, son. Um, where, where in that space you're an advocate for uh, uh, children and um, especially children with uh, disabilities and, um, and your work in the community? I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, uh, the question is, uh, um, my mom was a, uh, uh, she was in the daycare. Had a yeah. daycare and, um, so she could help her, uh, developmental disability son. Um, and so what work have you done to help well, other okay. children Great. in that, uh, same space and, and children all together? Great. Okay. I think what I, I didn't hear was work. Uh, what work have you done? Okay. Um, and so to answer your question, uh, I work with children and youth who are in foster care, so representing their legal interests and rights in dependency proceedings. I work, I've worked with children and youth who are in detention, so either immigration detention or in detention for juvenile crimes. Uh, and then I've worked with children and youth who are experiencing homelessness. So I've done a lot of work around securing rights for children and youth who are experiencing homelessness to have advocates in the schools. Thank you. Um, any further questions? I have one. Um, so, if elected, how would you work to ensure equity uh, for people of all backgrounds in your courtroom? I'm glad that you asked that, Nicole, because in my opinion, judicial bias is one of the most urgent problems of our legal system. And so one of the things that I think is really important, because um, you asked the question about in my courtroom. So one of the things that I think is really important for judges to do when they're hearing arguments, so they have to make decisions, or they're listening to a witness, is to ask, would I be receiving this information the same way if this person looked different, right? If they were a different gender, or if they were a different race, or if they presented somehow with some other difference, would I, be see would I still hear the same way? And I think that's a question that we have to ask ourselves constantly. And then taking a step back from that, there's a lot of work the judges can be doing, for example, around jury selection and around the kinds of decisions that are being made with charging in criminal cases to really look at equity issues. Great, thank you. Further questions? I always like to give folks a chance. All right, I have another one. 
This one's one of my favorite ones to ask. Uh, who are your judicial role models and why? <laughs> Great. Uh, so I have a couple of judicial role models, and now I'm kind of disappointed that I only have a minute to answer. Um, you know, obviously, first for me would be my mother, who's a judge, uh, Barbara Madsen, you know, elected to the Supreme Court in 1992, uh, the first woman to be popularly elected to that court. And she has done amazing groundbreaking work in our access to justice community. And so I admire her very much. And not just because she changed my diapers, right? As an adult, it's been interesting to be able to look at the things that she's done and been really impressed by them. Um, I think uh, Justice Yu is another person that I really admire. Mary Yu has incredible work ethic. I've had conversations with her over text message very late at night, and she is always responsive. And I think that's very impressive. And then recently in King County Superior Court watching Judge Josie Wiggs Martin has been an incredible experience because she has so much compassion for the people in the courtroom. Great, thank you. Further questions? I can keep looking. We should do that question again. I could go uh, on no. and on. If you we want, have judges. I we mean, have. I could give you another minute to go. Ahead <laughs> it's yourself. okay. Yeah. yeah um, I just, we have so many great judges that are just so incredible in Washington. We're very lucky. Oh, yes, we are. Um, so how about um, this one? Uh, would you describe a, an ethical dilemma that you faced um, and how you resolved it? Hmm. I think one of the challenges, particularly in the dependency system, working with children and youth in foster care, is there's always this ethical challenge that emerges when you have a client who's doing something that's not in their best interest, right? A teenager who's gone on the run, for example, and is at risk of trafficking. And as their attorney, my job is to advocate for what they want. 30 seconds. And that can be tricky because I'm also an adult who's looking at the life of a child thinking, uh, these are not good decisions. This is not safe, right? And so I think that that's something that is a, that's a tension for me in a lot of my cases. And it is for a lot of children, uh, attorneys who represent children. But I think ultimately the way that I resolve that Ten ethical seconds. dispute for me is to say, that it's my job to do what this client wants and to be this client's voice because they can't be their own voice in the courtroom. Great, okay, thank you. Any further questions? I have one. Go ahead, Clayton. <clears throat> However off the wall it may be. <clears throat> Great. We, um, uh, we, the larger we of the entire country, we. Um, we. yeah, the big we, uh, had the experience this week of watching um, a nominee for the second uh, court of, of appeals, the D.C. Circuit, um, who has been a judge for two months and who has never tried a case. Please comment. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about living in Washington is that we do elect our judges. And the reason that I appreciate that is because I think that I think that there it's only fair for the people who are going to experience judgment right, the people who have to use the system to have a stake and to have a say and who will be delivering those judgments and who will be managing that system. So in my mind, it's very important that we have a democratic process for selecting our judges. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, that is time. So would you like to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up? Thank you. My name is Hillary Madsen. I am running for King County Superior Court. And when the time comes, I hope to be able to earn your votes. 
And the reason that I hope to earn your vote is because I'm the best candidate to bring reform, because I'm committed to seeing and hearing people who are marginalized, and because I have the diversity of legal experience the King County Superior Court needs. Thank you. Thank you.